everybody. Thanks hey. for being here. Um, I brought a prop. Cool. This does relate to the comments I'm about to make. <laughs> weird. It's so weird. <laughs> These are my notes. Um, so I should start out by saying TC is my chosen family. He's my bro. Um, and so there's a lot of intimacy that you might sense here because we are family. Um, I feel like I should disclose that before we start our conversation. Um, because if you want to know about TC's role specifically as Tucson's new po poet laureate, I direct you to this beautiful interview that Maria Herreras did in the Tucson Weekly, Hannah Enser's gorgeous photograph. Um, there's also a wonderful um, blog on the Arts Foundation for Tucson in Southern Arizona, previously TPAC and also at the University of Arizona Poetry Center blog. There's some really detailed information about where TC wants to take this position, what he plans on doing in terms of uh, youth programming in Tucson and, and moving that forward and collaborating with that. Um, but tonight we have this unique opportunity for two very close friends to share a few moments of vulnerability in public. Um, if you've read TC's work or spent any time with him, you know that he values being open and vulnerable. It's kind of his whole jam. This conversation may touch on more run-of-the-mill things, but we plan to focus on the topics of masculinity, sobriety, the body, and TC's new poems in progress. So if that's not what you were looking for, <laughs> I do hope you'll no, stick no. around. I hope, I hope that this will be a really interesting evening for all of us. Um, so I'm going to ask TC some questions on those topics, and we're going to open it up um, for, for a broader Q&A. So if you have any questions for our prestigious new poet laureate. Um, you should save them up towards the end and we will have time for that. So let's start with the body. Can, we, can you try to project and start to hear, but we have a larger crowd than anticipated. I will project. Thank you. I was a musical theater person in high school. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I wasn't. <laughs> Bro. Yeah. Yes. You've been pretty open about how a car accident has affected your body your mobility, your ability to write, and even function in the world. And as a result of that and some other studies, you've decided to do some EMT training, um, but not necessarily become an EMT. So can you talk more about the experience of the car accident, how that's influenced your work, but also how that's influenced your new course of study? Sure. That'll be easy questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, so just quick background, about a year ago, um, I, was in a, I was in a cab in LA and the cab T-boned someone else. <laughs> and it was, aside from the injury part, which I'll get to in a second, it was, there was also something incredibly beautiful and stilling about the moment of impact or actually the few moments right after impact because I'd just been riding in this car. I really thought I was only going like five blocks. The whole reason I was in the cab was because I bought a bunch of books. And I was like, ooh, I'm going to take care of my body. And I had a car. <laughs> yeah, she had my car. Um, <laughs> and so, and it was just that sort of quiet, I'm riding through a big city that I don't know cab ride. And then I see us heading into a car and I yelled and it was like, my body or my voice came um, it, it it sort of jumped out of me it flew out of me in a way that was so uncontrolled um, and and after we made impact I just remember this driver who had never I'd really spoken to be like I'm going to this place and he was like cool that was it right and suddenly he's holding his heart and I was like I love this man and it was so um, like sacred there was something so sacred about that moment um, so I'm still sort of carrying that with me and trying to make sense of it and the frustration of in that moment I also displaced like four ribs <laughs> and so um, which I kind of thought mm, with a lot of hubris, I'm sure, that that was not a big deal. <laughs> and that I could just be like, oh, it's fine, I'll just get 
get over that real fast. And my partner can attest to what a long process that's been. <laughs> um, and the biggest thing is that it completely sort of unraveled my identity as a writer because I could no longer write, like could not sit at a computer, could not hold a, a pen for very long, just couldn't be upright like this because this was all unstable. As it turns out, you use your ribs a lot. <laughs> Who knew? Um, <laughs> I had no idea. Um, and so I've been through a gender transition um, what feels like a thousand years ago. Um, so I was, I didn't feel like I was a stranger to not recognizing my body or not recognizing myself in my body or how my body could relate to me or the world. But this was a, a whole new level because it also separated me from the way that I made sense of the world. Um, and, and it also meant that my, I couldn't do teaching because then you have to sit at a computer and you have to grade, right? It sort of changed, it took it all away. And, um, and I'm a pretty active person, so it, was, it really was just kind of like, oh, that was cute. You thought you knew who you were. <laughs> um, you thought you'd had all that figured out. And so it brought me back to a place of, um, I mean, back. I say back like I'd ever been there. Um, to a place of, of real s stillness um, and, um, and fear, like utter sort of, I don't know who I am or going to become kind of fear. And it also moved poetry from the place that it, it had moved to in my life, which was, I guess, kind of a, it's hard to say that poetry could ever be a career, but it was definitely my work. And it ripped it out of that sphere and moved it back to a, a very spiritual practice. And so I, I moved into writing haiku because that was kind of all I could hold space for in my brain. Um, and I would speak into my phone. So I'm like laying in bed, watching the birds and feeling very jealous of them. Um, <laughs> And also kind of in love with them, like in love with these things that I'd seen all around me forever, but never really taken the time to look at. And, um, and I would text them, text these haikus one line at a time to a student who was also struggling with writing. And sort of through this six month period of me just saying, that tree is awesome. No, you know, you sort of like over and over and over again. <laughs> see me do this a lot um, it, it just became prayer and um, so it's it's changed me in ways that I not just my physical self but my my emotional and spiritual landscape yeah in, in ways that I couldn't foresee at all and probably wouldn't have signed up for but now I'm okay with it <laughs> and what about EMT stuff oh yeah sorry no so the EMT really quick could you yeah. Would anybody standing in the back like to come sit on this bench? There's a few more seats if you want to be comfortable. Come on over, Brooke. Come Do on it, over. Brooke. Come on. Walk the runway. Just walk right here. <laughs> yes. Hold yeah. it. Hold yeah. it. Also incredible writer, teacher of Um. <laughs> so, so the EMT stuff, I mean, I've, I've worked in wilderness for, um, for about 15 years now. I lead wilderness trips for Outward Bound. Tiny plug, if you know any youth who are queer and or who have experienced a significant death loss, I'm doing two different courses this summer that deal with those things. Side, side note. Um, but so through that, I had wilderness medicine training. And in that moment of the accident, um, I just experienced my own body's vulnerability and realized I don't even have the language for it. Like, I don't even know what the things are that moved. And I'm a writer. Like, what, what am I doing? <laughs> you know, so, um, so in the fall, I took, um, so this was about six months after the accident, I signed up for an anatomy and physiology class. And part of that, I think, certainly in retrospect, I didn't know why I was doing it at the time, but was, a, I think, a way to make peace with my body. Mm -hmm. um, 
for years I had been asking after I'd seen a friend in a really bad climbing accident, I would sort of meet medical people like on planes and shit and be like, okay, I have a question for you. <laughs> Is the body more resilient or more fragile than we believe? And every person in the medical field would say to me, more resilient, hands down. Hands down. And I was like, really? We're all so convinced of this. And so I feel like I got to experience some of that. And, and I wanted to extend some of that, um, that skill and that training. And um, yeah, I have no idea if I'll be in, I, I will definitely get my certification. I've passed all my, my tests so far. <laughs> but I'm kind of a nerd. But, um, <laughs> But yeah, I don't know if that's a job I could do or want to do, but it's definitely um, information and skill that is, is stunning. And I will add one thing, which is Marie Howe says that if you're ever in grief and you don't know what to do, learn something. And so that's what I do every time, which has put me in a lot of classes I didn't know it would be in. <laughs> okay, I have a follow-up question. Great. Um, today is Akila Oliver's birthday. Akila Oliver, an incredible New York based poet um, who passed away about five years ago. Um, she taught at Naropa, she taught at the University of Denver, she taught at various community places in New York. Um, but she used to, she had a question. She had a question that she would ask of so many people she met. And several of her students and friends and collaborators have continued this question, which is what are the limits of the body? So that's my next question. What are the limits of the body? I know, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's no one answer. I know there's not, but I'd like to give a decent one. Um, <laughs> I mean, I guess what, what that called to mind was Adrian Rich, who says, war is a failure of imagination. And so when I think about what the limits of the body are, I think the limits are what, it, like, the, they're the limits of our imagination, right? Like, they're, they're how we sort of fail mm -hmm. to imagine it could be something else. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I don't feel like that's particularly unique to my way of thinking or, or even... Um, yeah, unique in general. And I, I can see the sort of Adrian Rich. Okay, I'm uh, gonna. Can I jump in? Yeah. Y'all. No. <laughs> yes. yes. It's a little bit weird to be doing this. Yes. <laughs> this is weird. <laughs> right? This is really weird. It's interesting. Okay, I'm just saying, if at any point you're like, yo. <laughs> This is weird. I'm annoyed. I want to talk about something else. <laughs> Just holler. We can totally do so maybe something. Maybe I should say, I am loving it. Okay. Oh, great. Well, bro, I appreciate that. But I'm just saying, for real, we can spice it up. So go ahead. Oh. That's <laughs> great. We can bring Rosie up here. We can talk about their sex life. Yeah. I'm sure. <laughs> just kidding, Rosie. Rosie's dying. <laughs> She's like, leave me alone. I'm in the back. That's um, amazing. Okay, I guess we won't do that yet. <laughs> Instead, let's talk about masculinity. <laughs> that relates. <laughs> okay, so I want to know how have cultural expectations of gender changed for you? As you, Can you guys hear me okay? Okay. How have cultural expectations of gender changed for you as your presentation has shifted from more feminine to more masculine in the world? Um, expectations of gender. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, it's cliche. Like, I, I totally didn't want, like, in some ways I didn't want to believe it in my, like, gender and women's studies classes, like in undergrad. Um, what do you mean men have different experiences of the world? Fuck that, you know? Like, I'll show them. Um, and it's like, oh, no, that's true. So, I mean, I think, I think... Um, for instance, I think my uh, 
success, if you will, like in, in poetry land, um, and even related to like Tucson Poet Laureate and stuff, is I think it's directly tied to the fact that I'm a passing white trans guy. Like I think if I were not passing, or if I were not white, um, and not like I don't particularly look in the mirror and be like, "Ooh, I'm attractive," but I know that I fall into certain categories of like acceptable and like whatever. Um, You're good looking. But you know what I'm saying? Like yeah. I'm, oh, I'm, I, know I have no saying. interest in calling myself that, but I I know that I fit into certain expectations, right, and norms, and I have seen a direct correlation between the sort of respect, the the uh, inclusion. Yeah, inclusion, but like uh, way, steps up a ladder or something mm -hmm. um, that I've gotten since transition mm -hmm. and in particular passing um, I mean I would say I'm actually not more masculine now than I was before I started to presentation to the world I, well and I think the way that I am is just through facial hair <clears throat> like I was much more masculine before I started testosterone because I was constantly trying to like project masculinity and mm -hmm. be like yo like see me you know <laughs> And now I'm like, oh girl, like. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I want to sort of just soften all of that. Like I, I have no interest in sort of taking on all of that. Um, I, and I think you know, if I can go off the question just a little bit, I mean, I, I certainly ex experience a difference in how the world responds to me, but I also experience this deep dissonance in how I experience the world. Because I still experience myself as a female body. Like, and I spent 30 years living and walking the planet as a girl and as a woman. So I walk through the world and I'm like confused a lot of the time like when, when people are responding to me in, in certain ways. Um, and I still look at, in particular, um, if I can just call on some stereotypes here, some uh, some like dyke presentation, like people who present as dykes, I totally am like, <laughs> and they're like, <laughs> you can't do the, the lesbian nod. You don't get the right? lesbian nod. I know it's so weird. I'm like. <laughs> Like, no, no, you're not. <laughs> so it's like, and that's just like this tiny thing, right? Like what I'm really getting at is walking through the world as a woman, people think they can reach to you and touch you. Your body is public property. And some of that is nice and lovely. And like, I miss certain kinds of hugs and tenderness from strangers. Like I, I love that shit. And there are lines, <laughs> lots of lines, people, um, that I feel like people who have never walked through the world with a female body need to do some work to understand. Um, because it is fucking different. <laughs> and now that I walk through the world with this body, I also understand the distance with which male presenting people are expected to have like don't touch me certainly men with other men there's there's none of that right so i truly have never experienced loneliness like i've experienced on this side of testosterone um never experienced public sort of just distance um it's gross. I mean, it's it's heartbreaking and really, really sad. Um, yeah. So, so I don't know if that. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's interesting. I mean, I had this much. Rest of the interview. Just like this. Now it's gonna be awkward. <laughs> um, but I remember this moment. So, um, this was. I'm like Ben. I can point you out. This was a time when we were working together. Um, a young woman 
had an accident like right on 4th Ave. And like I said, I had some wilderness medicine training and so a lot of my students came to me, they were like, TC, will you come help? This woman is hurt. And so I come around the corner, she's young, she's like 15 or 16, and she had actually fallen, she was climbing a fence, it had fallen and it had impaled her Ooh. almost in the ass. <laughs> she was not in good, she was hurting. Um, but the point is that I got to her and I had been on testosterone for like a year and a half at that point. So for me, I was very much like, no one sees, no one's calling me sir, like any of that in my mind, even though people were. And so I leaned down, like I said, I'm from the South. And I was like, hey, sweetie, how you doing? Like, okay, let's talk. And I was immediately like touching her, you know, just like all the like Southern woman ways that I was trained to interact with people. And the look on her face, I mean, I saw it immediately. She was just like, like get your fucking hands off of me creeper you know like and i was like oh shit like these are these are man's hands now right like and not only that they're white man's hands and she probably reads me as straight and oh my god like you know like what is happening like, um and that was a i mean i've had that happen actually in multiple different scenarios where i've sort of thought well, I'm bringing this history of how I was raised and, and these ways of communicating, and that is deeply unacceptable in this presentation, whether because it's threatening or because it's just, it doesn't align with the expectation of this stuff. Yeah. yeah. This is interesting. I think we're doing a great job. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> This is actually how we talk to each other. It's really true. We're like, you're doing so good. Ask, look at these questions. Look at your answers. You're so smart. You're really good. You're really good. <laughs> um, this might be a, this actually, I don't know what your answer is going to be. So I'm not going to make assumptions. I want to know what conversations that you have had in exclusively male groups, male quotation, 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 that you would not have been privy to it as a more feminine presenting person. Um, yeah, have there been conversations? I think about where this question came from is I think about lines to a gendered woman's room. Yeah. And I think about the conversations that female bodied folks have in that space. Um, the, the sort of camaraderie that can happen in that space. Um, and so I'm, I'm, as someone who has never been in a space that is considered exclusively male presenting, I'm wondering, like, are there conversations that you've been privy to in those spaces? Yeah, I mean... Um, or are they too secret? Well, they're, that's right. I no, they're, well, they're so secret that we keep them from each other. That's the thing. Like, that's, the, that's what I'm saying. It's like the, the loneliness is so intense. Um, and they're, not that there's not like joking around, hey, how's it going, whatever. It's not that there's like a total silence, although in lots of restrooms there are. And I do miss the restroom like, oh my God, did you see that? You know, like whatever, just chat. Um, I'm also, like I said, from the South, so we're pretty chatty. So I bring sort of the double desire for chat. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but but the, the men's spaces that I've inhabited from, you know, a lot, I mean, the EMT world is very, is male dominated, mm -hmm. certainly not exclusively male, but very male dominated. Um, a lot of the wilderness spaces are, are pretty male dominated. Um, and then just like bathrooms and locker rooms and shit like that. Um, and yeah, I mean, I find there to be um, just a, a real, uh, certainly I've seen and experienced some, some sort of uh, blatant sexism and um, misogyny, but honestly, it's so sort of cliche that it's like not even worth talking about. Mm -hmm. um, 
the thing that feels much more complex to me and, and I guess interesting and like what I'd be interested in pulling apart is um, how guys sort of enact those things subtly, you know, um, and, um, and without, without explicit conversation. I mean, the bathroom feels like a really classic place where it's just like, you can't talk to another dude and you certainly can't be friendly or just sort of strike up a casual conversation because it's like, well, you're hitting on, you're clearly hitting on them. And that's a contentious moment. It couldn't be a moment of pride, right? Like, <laughs> or just a moment of like, oh, we're just chatting like, or whatever, you know, human connectivity. Yeah, anything. Um, so that is still very strange to me. And I even, I really experienced it a lot. Like, so I go to class with these guys and then we go to the bathroom at the same time. And it's like, we walk into the door and suddenly we can't talk to each other. It's so bizarre. I'm like, you got, we were just, we we're just chatting right outside, you know, like right next to each other. No, just like straight ahead, just like doing my thing. And I've tried to break that down and it's, I really get like monosyllabic answers from dudes I'm totally hanging out with. Like these are not strangers, you know, like, um, so it's that kind of stuff where I'm like, I'm not making this up. Like, this is, this is happening, <laughs> but there's no way to really talk about it. It's not a silence. It's a, it's, it's, it truly makes me sad. It's not a, yeah. uh, I think there was a time when I felt a little more like angry about it or um, sort of cynical or wanted to sort of jab at like men are stupid for doing that. And now I'm just like, oh God, what we sort of enforce on masculinity, what we expect of it, what we, um, what, yeah, what we, the ways that we police masculinity, mm -hmm. it's, um, it's, it's, it's devastating, I think. It's really devastating. I think you already answered my next question, but I'm just going to say it out loud. I also just got a little distracted by Sia. Did you hear yeah. the chandeliers? I just wanted to, like, Grab something from the chandelier. Totally. Ear, 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 ear. Um, so this is the question, but you may have already answered it, so you'd be like, skip. Um, how you've been affected by toxic ma masculinity over the course of your life? Yeah. Done. Okay. So that's not true. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I, I think we're all affected by it. I don't think I'm. So, I don't think I'm unique in being affected by it. No, but you're really good at talking about it. Thank you. Um, so masculine. Um, I mean, I think the biggest way that I'm impacted by it, and I, I suspect that all of us are impacted by it, is that toxic masculinity only allows people to be a certain part of themselves. Like, that's, that's the impact, right? It's like, you only get to be part of who you are. And that's fucked up, like, for anybody. And so... So that's, that's the thing I'll add. Thank you. Thank you. So we're gonna shift a little bit. Um, I want you to talk a little bit about your Dear Melissa poems. Yeah, here you. Um, I'm asking TC, one of TC's uh, newer projects that he's been working on are a series of poems called Dear Melissa. Um, and I was asking him to speak to that project and those poems and tell us more about it. Did you bring one by any chance to show? Yeah, I brought my laptop. So I brought all of them. Okay. <laughs> I'm hope, would, well, do you want to start? I'm by not reading all of them. Do you want to start by sharing one so that there's some context in case folks? Oh, we can just talk about them in the abstract. No. <laughs> Don't you want to hear a poem? Yeah. 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 Thanks a lot, y'all. <laughs> well, so the I'll talk about the context while I'm pulling it up. Um, so Melissa is my birth name, and um, some trans folks refer to the name that they were given by um, the people who cared for them at a young age um, as their dead name, and which I think is totally awesome and, and important to, to name. Um, I, I still refer to Melissa as my birth name. Um, when I changed my name to TC, um, it felt really important for me um, to, to keep my name Melissa. So that's my middle name now. Um, 
Melissa Dong to be exact. And, um, and that was a, a big moment for me because I was always, you know, sort of, uh, I, I always identified actually as a dyke. Um, and that felt really comfortable for me. It still feels actually really comfortable for me. Um, and, w and when I started testosterone, my intention and my, my hope was, n was not, I never felt trapped in the wrong body. Some folks do. That's not my experience. So I don't want to act like that's my experience. Um, and I don't want to act like there's a universal trans narrative, which I think can be pretty damaging for, again, in the same way that toxic masculinity is damaging universal narratives of any sort. So, um, so I've, you know, not had any surgeries. I'm, I'm on testosterone. Um, and when I transitioned, it felt very much like Melissa's who got me to TC. Like I couldn't be TC without Melissa. And, but that didn't mean I wanted to hang out as Melissa for the rest of my life. It was just like, she was awesome. Thanks, girl. And so, um, high five, like handoff, kind of. Um, that said, I certainly spent, I would say, a lot of time not foregrounding her or that history. Um, and I, you know, in retrospect, I can sort of look back and sort of see ways that that might be my own shit or whatever, but also just needing to get situated in this body and this self. Um, anyway, back to the accident, which was when I was right laying around <laughs> and suddenly really in my body again. And I started to gain weight, which is neither here nor there, except for that suddenly my breasts were huge. Oh. We always joke about because I'm always like, my breasts are so big. I'm like, yes, sister, it's like twins. <laughs> twins. <Yeah. laughs> Many conversations. Um, bless you. Um, so um, for a long time, I wore a compression shirt um, and, and then stopped because it was just starting to hurt and stuff like that. And then I started to gain this weight. And so I went from being able to pass as a flat chested person to suddenly really having breasts and I know they're not huge but they feel huge and they feel visible. I honor your experience. I honor your experience. <laughs> and my hips also suddenly went from like structurally sort of childbearing to now they have the padding <coughs> that goes along with that <laughs> ability. And um, so my body which <coughs> through the course of transition became my dad's face and body and I can literally see that. Now the rest of me is so clearly my mom's body. I mean, I like look in the mirror and I'm like, hey, Darlene, like what is happening, you know? Um, so that's been this, on top of the accident stuff, this other sort of gender thing that, that came up. And so in, in lying about the yard and the house, I was thinking, I wonder what Melissa thinks about all this, you know, like, I want to, like, pick up that, like, 17-year-old girl and that, like, 21-year-old girl who got married to a man in a big Catholic wedding, um, <laughs> you know, and, like, bring them here and be like, what do you think? Like, you, you dig it? Like, did we do all right? You know, like, um... And so I just started writing these letters to her. Um, that's the backstory. Ooh, that was long. That was good. Um, okay, can I do this one? Can I give you just a touch more backstory for this particular one called Dear Melissa, as they are called? Um, my mom, who I'm very close with now, um, but when I first, uh, through several iterations of coming out as queer and then coming out as trans and then starting testosterone, um, she's struggled with it a lot. And, um, and at one point when I started testosterone, threatened to kill herself. And um, so it was hard, like we had some hard times. And then... 
I'd say like three or four years after that, she came to visit me here in Tucson and, and she was chill, like she was cool. We were hanging out and I was like, mom, what happened? And, um, and she said, you know, all of your life, I prayed for God to change you. And I was like, mm, this isn't going well. <laughs> and, and she was like, but I realized I was praying the wrong prayer. And what I need to be praying is for God to change me because you're fine. You know, I know, right? Go D. Um, and so our relationship is complex and ever evolving. And um, this poem is sort of dealing with that. Um, and this statement that she said to me when we were when I was a kid, which is she said, "I wish you'd never been born," and and that was sort of a uh, a thing that she would say when we when things were hard. Dear Melissa, I wish you, my mother once told me, mother of my childhood, even though water is water weary, what is prayer if not quiet? Who has made me? What hands you become? when you touch who laid down on whose body whose face and whose shoulders worth shaking what will I not hear when I look back at you who is not the mother of a daughter who is not the mother of a man we are right to be afraid of our bodies wind is carried by what is upright and still moves what has had been buried deep enough in the ground to be called roots. When will this be the world where you stop? Whatever broke into you was torn by the contact. A face wears a face it can see. What is alive is unrecognizable. Need it be? Who is my mother, mother? No one. Who hasn't killed herself by growing into someone? I'm sorry you have never been born. That's great. If you guys had some trouble hearing that because of the engines, there's actually another Dear Melissa poem on the University of Arizona Poetry Center blog if you'd like to read some more. And on the Tucson Weekly blog, or their online version. I did not know that. Yeah. And on the Tucson Weekly. Do we have time for uh, another question and then opening it up? Where's Bill? Oh, hey. <laughs> Are we I think we're at an hour. Yeah, Bill. Well, no, we've got one more question. Okay. Um, and then we're going to open it up in case anybody else has questions. Because uh, we got started late. Listen, y'all, don't feel like you have to stay. Yeah, don't. Um, so TC has been sober for a number of years. How many years? 15. 15 years. Um, I have his permission to ask about sobriety in these questions, just so you know. I'm not that kind of, I'm not that kind of girl. Um, so my question for you is, what are some alternatives to evenings spent getting high, getting drunk, and watching Netflix? <laughs> I don't have to give that question context. Apparently there's some experience in the crowd. <laughs> well, there's always sugar and coffee. <laughs> Still get to keep Netflix, right? Yeah, and you still get to keep Netflix. I mean, there's all sorts of replacement addictions out there. Come on. Um, Sugar and coffee are why we're here. Right? Yeah, right. Thank you. <laughs> um, I mean, that's the thing. Like, yeah, I don't, um, I don't use illegal substances anymore, and I don't, I don't drink anymore. But it's kind of hard to sometimes say that. I'm sober because I um, I think it's fair to say that sometimes I'm very much a dry addict, right? Like, um, well, how would you define sober? Is it okay for me to interrupt you? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think sobriety has something to do with um, one's ability to sit in the desire or in the want and to not fill it in. And it doesn't mean that we don't fill things in all the time, 
but I know, hell, I did it right before this started. I needed to have dinner. I got here. I looked at the crowd and I was like, I'm nervous. I'll take a chocolate cupcake, please. <laughs> like, and that was my dinner. And like, is that the worst thing I could do? Of course not. Like, it's fine. It's totally fine. And was I able to deal with my feelings in that moment? Not entirely. Like, you know, like, I was, I was, I could have done a number of other things to sort of be like, you're feeling anxious, right? Like, and just sort of been with what I was feeling. And instead, I was like, I actually just don't want to feel this. And chocolate cupcake is going to be the trick right now. Like, and it worked. <laughs> <laughs> so good. Um, and like, yeah, I am proud of the fact that I, um, I mean, proud is like a weird word. Uh, Pleased. I'm, I'm thankful. <laughs> That um, that I that I that I don't um, that I don't use other substances, because mm -hmm. um, because I'm not good with it. <laughs> like, like we don't we don't go well together, you know. Even when I think that we do, you know. Like, um, and I, it's so funny. I went through this. So when the accident happened. I had never been a coffee drinker, and I suddenly was like, I need energy. I'm laying around. First, I was like chocolate-covered espresso beans. Everything's chill. Everything's fine. And then I was like, and just in the last couple of months, I've been like, I will find myself going to bed and thinking about tomorrow I get to drink coffee. <laughs> I'm like, oh my god, this is amazing. <laughs> And it's like just about every night. I know. It's like, but it's a feeling that I don't. I don't want to have that feeling, but it's it's more than I don't want to have that feeling. It's like I'm somehow like acting out of a. Uh, I'm just not listening to myself. You know, like I'm not letting myself hear something that seems really important. And I and there's a part of me that's just like downright stubborn, where it's like, God damn it, like. You've dealt with your sexual abuse from childhood. You've dealt with transition. You've dealt with all these things. Like, you cannot drink coffee, you know? Like, like you can feel your anxiety. Shut up, you know? And I just get, like, mad, you know? So anyway, that's all to say I haven't had coffee in over a week. <laughs> I feel very proud. Oh, I don't need an applause. Right? As I'm your friend like, <laughs> who had coffee about 30 <laughs> minutes ago, right when we started? Or however much, I don't know. Um, well, and I want to just add, like, I mean, some people can have, right? Like some people can do all of that and they're not sort of like wrapped up in that, like I'm not feeling the feelings thing, right? Or like some people know how to like not feel their feelings sometimes or feel their feelings other times. Like, awesome. I'm I'm truly psyched for you. <laughs> like a little jealous and like truly psyched for you. Um, and I know for myself, like I, uh, I have a, I have that, I don't know, that brain, that something, you know, that is, um, that just goes there, right? Like, mm -hmm. it really goes there. And, um, and I'm, just because I'm not using other substances doesn't mean I'm not, yeah, you know? totally. So I think we should, and I'm all for joy. Oh, yeah. That's all I have to say. All for joy. I think I want to end by trying to repeat what, you said, but I'm going to mash it up so maybe KXCI can help me remember from the microphone or someone else. When you said, when you said uh, that sitting with the silence, like sitting with your feelings, sitting with their, that was the, probably the most apt description of sobriety that I've ever heard. Oh. So nice work. Good job. Um, so let's open it up. Does anybody have questions? Yes. Can we meet Rosie? I, that's Rosie's decision. <laughs> People want to meet you. <laughs> <laughs> that's Rosie's decision. Look at her. She's cool. Hi, Rosie. Let's give Rosie a round of applause.
probably should actually give her applause because for the really the first six months after my accident, she like she was basically like, I'll do the dishes, I'll do the laundry. And you were grumpy. And I was grumpy, and she was so nice. So nice. <laughs> So nice to you. She was so nice to you. <laughs> she deserves all the applause. That's all I'm um, any other questions? Yes, please. <laughs> to not to be indelicate, but how old are you now? Just for the context of how long you walked in, around in your female body versus your post-transition life. Yeah, that's not indelicate. I'm, yeah, thank you. I'm 42 now, and I started testosterone when I was 31. And part two, can you talk about your plans as poet laureate for youth poetry programming, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, I mean, I have lots of dreams, and we'll see which ones can we can make happen. But one thing that I'm really interested in is getting trans poetry and trans voices, in particular youth, um, in bathrooms. And I don't mean putting trans people at risk <laughs> by, like, hanging out in bathrooms and being visible. <laughs> Um, but I do mean like sound loops um, and like poetry installations because I think trans people are, we're in bathrooms, right? Like, but I want our voices in and in, in a way of sort of experiencing our, our like most powerful, beautiful selves um, just in the sphere, you know, like in this really contested area. So that's the thing I'm interested in. I'm also really interested in working in particular with like schools or youth programs. I've done this a lot with Made for Flight, which was a kite project that I did for five years and Ben has picked up since then. Ben, you're amazing, thank you. Um, uh, which commemorated uh, trans people who've been murdered in the previous year. So we would make kites in honor of them and display those at Dia de los Muertos. Um, so working with, with similar groups, um, GSAs, things like that, and going to um, blood mobiles, like places where folks are donating blood. Because I think a lot of times we talk about the arts as life-giving, but I feel like we often still, like poets in particular, sometimes expect people to just come to us. Like, don't you want to come hear my poetry? <laughs> and it's like, no, we got to go to people. And yeah. so... I would like to have readings at bloodmobiles and places like that so that poets can give a little blood <laughs> and give a little life. And also we could actually take poetry to people just where they are, doing the good things that they do. Because um, I think people live poetry all the time. Um, so I'd like to sort of move it out in that way. What's your relationship with the Poetry Center? Uh, I teach for them. Um, and so. And I, you know, I know a lot of the folks there really well, but yeah, I teach at the writers in the schools. And so I teach, most recently I taught uh, sixth graders. And then last year I taught fourth and fifth graders. So it's pretty good. At the U of A? Well, no, so the Poetry Center has a writers in the schools program. Oh. And that's what I was doing. Oh. Yeah. Anybody else? Yes, please. Back to the children. No, the yeah. children. <laughs> Can we talk about, um, Made for flight, I saw, I didn't realize there was a connection, but um, when I was observing, I'm a pre-service teacher, art ed teacher, when I was observing at um, City High, I oh, saw nice. that, and I was like, this is amazing. Yeah. I was wondering if you could speak more about, like, what schools you've worked at, and kind of the process of getting, like, putting the two together, you know what I mean? Yeah. So I, um, when I moved here in 2003, I immediately started volunteering at Wingspan and Eon, um, and then in 2000. Five, I started working there as a youth outreach specialist and so through that I worked with something like 30 different GSAs across Tucson so I was really lucky in that like I just got to work with a lot of rad young queer folks and um, and also at the same time was you know, writing poetry doing that sort of thing and then I was going once a year there's a trans day of remembrance November 20th and um, the first one I went to was here in Tucson, and there were about 10 of us trans people standing around in a dark corner, holding hands and feeling really sad. Appropriately, lots of trans people are murdered every year. And, but I, each year I would keep going back to these vigils and look around and be like, 
where are all the cis people, right? Like, all as trans people, we just keep coming back and feeling sort of re-traumatized by this. Like, where is everybody? And so through that, I, w I thought, well, I can go and get them. <laughs> I sometimes have a big ego. <laughs> and so I was like, I'll go get them. <laughs> so, um, but I was like, how do I want to commemorate, like, how do I want to sort of shift some of this dynamic? And I, I mean, I don't know where the idea came from so much, but um, I thought we can make, I can go into schools, make kites with them, and then write poems. And, and the kites would, I noticed at these vigils, we were just always looking down. And I'm like, trans people are fucking beautiful. Like, I, I don't know of anyone more beautiful than every trans person I meet. Like, I, I meet a trans person, I'm just like, God, I love you so much. Like, um, and I'm just like, let's, can we please, like, just uplift trans folks? Like, can we please do that? And especially these folks who've been murdered because I feel like the, the way that they're remembered is for the most gruesome thing that ever happened to them. And they lived really full, complex lives, just like everybody, you know? So um, so I just wanted some sort of like act in which like there was some kind of transcendence, you know? And um, so yeah, so the kites and then the poems and, and it just worked like city high. I mean, so I ended up working with probably I think 15 different schools, 10 or 15 different schools across town. I've taken it to New York to um, like Pennsylvania, like several other states have been interested. What's, but what's interesting about Tucson is because we have that, this particular procession, the kites work kind of perfectly here because there's a sort of community place to bring that morning together and that uplifting moment. Whereas, you know, for other programs where I've brought it, they might display the kites and, and things like that, but they're a little bit out of context, right? There's just sort of these kites, you know? Um, so I, I find this, this is really a great place for it. And like I said, Ben has carried that on. And thank you, Ben, for continuing to do that. Because it's amazing. Do you feel up for like one more question? Okay. We're gonna do one more question, if anybody has one more question. And we don't have to, because Bro's tired. Yes, please. I don't have a question, I just have a comment. Yeah. Um, it's really interesting. You have a perspective on male and female that so many of us don't. And we uh, have our own perspective of what we think the other sex, how they behave. And, you know, so it's really interesting to hear your perspective on. In, you know, you have had this wonderful experience of being able to see both sides and being able to appreciate, you know, what you have in both and bring it together in a unique person. Whereas we all are unique people, but we don't have as unique of an experience as you do. So it's really interesting to hear your experience and appreciate you sharing that. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.